Our scripture this morning is from 1 Samuel 17 and also from Mark 4. 1 Samuel 17 verses 32 through 49. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go! And may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put, on a, he put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I'm not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his Philistine's in his shepherd's bag, in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to him, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine, David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell down on the ground. And from Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the weaves, waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Please pray with me. Lord God, you are a safe place. For those who are oppressed, you are a safe harbor for all of us when we travel through difficult times. We trust your name and call upon you to be with us while knowing that you have never left. We remind ourselves of your everlasting love and grace while knowing that you will judge us by the ways in which we care for those who suffer 
you will never forget their cries. You see in us what we could have done as much as what we choose to do. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Each of us has a particular amount of power within the place we live, within this particular society that we live in, because of the ways often that our identities define us. Whether we identify as women or men, as young or old, how our race is defined for us or by us, what kind of wealth we have or seem to have, how we influence others puts us within multiple kinds of hierarchy, depending on where we are, and that may change depending on our current situation. You might be boss in one building and servant in another. For example, I am a middle-aged married woman of European descent, and I have a position of leadership in this church. In some churches, as a woman, I would not be welcome to stand where I am standing. I would not have authority to preach or to teach or to lead a mixed gender group of people. Yet, as a person of European descent, I have the privilege of having family whose rights to land and jobs were never questioned. My spouse, um, because I identify as white, um, in some places in this nation world, my spouse has more authority than I do. In my family, I am the youngest of my siblings and a woman. So my power is reflected in the ways that they treat either younger people than themselves or women in my strongly patriarchal family. Places of work are hierarchical. Bosses have more power in decision-making than other, work, other workers. Sometimes bosses are owners, so they have that kind of decision-making power as well. Owners, operators, executive officers of large businesses like multinational companies usually have the kind of power that leads to influence in their beyond them their own business into other businesses and in the political world. So who do we think of in this day and age as the most powerful people in our world or in our nation? Government leaders are sometimes thought of as powerful. Those with wealth and influence who are heard by those who govern may be more powerful in our eyes. In local communities, power is in local business leaders, perhaps, or in justice or law enforcement or local government, those who can get stuff done. It may just be the lady who can make the phone call to the right person, too, who has power. So those kind of underground things. In churches, leadership gets caught in these kinds of power as well. Those who have influence in the community may also have power in a church. In the biblical world, as in our world, people with the most strength of some kind or wealth or influence likely had the most power. And people who are weaker, poorer, or without connections tend to have the least power. King Saul was a strong warrior. That's how he got his job. He was chosen by the people of Israel because he was a good general. He led armies and fought, fought battles and did powerful things. David, which we, who we read about just last week, had been chosen to be Saul's successor, but Saul doesn't know that yet. So he has potential, according to God, and he was chosen from a family of warriors. His brothers are warriors. But out of those brothers, he was the youngest, the smallest, and the weakest, and the most vulnerable. In today's text from 1 Samuel, David was at the battlefield where the army of Israel is meeting the army of the Philistines. For 40 days, the giant warrior Goliath a man thought to be between seven and ten feet tall, had, had been ta taunting Saul's army, taunting the army of Israel. 
God's chosen people. David had gone there to help Saul out, and David had been watching Goliath insult and berate the army. And so the text we read today says he asked around to find out why no one had volunteered to go up, go up against the giant. Prior to the text I read, Dave, um, the king had offered wealth, marriage to his daughter, and tax forgiveness to the man who beat Goliath. And David wondered why no one had tried. His brothers taunted him and told him to go back to the sheep because he had no idea what he was talking about. You've never fought before like this. David was young. He was brave. It seems he's fought a lion or two and a bear. So he volunteered to fight the Philistine champion. He said, the Lord who rescued me from the power of both lions and bears will rescue me from the power of this Philistine. That's either crazy or brave or both. David was a boy, it says, according to most, maybe between 13 and 15. Saul liked him, at least so far. So he put David in his own royal armor to protect him. But David realized that armor built for a full-grown man, something he wasn't used to, was not going to work. He couldn't walk, let alone do anything else. So David faced Goliath the same way he fought predators away from the sheep. He took out his slingshot and gathered five stones the soldiers were too well conditioned to battlefield and saw only armor and large weapons as the thing that won out. David, it seems, looked at things differently from his inexperience. He was used to relying only on God's power on what he had all by himself with God. David trusted God. It seems the power of God had made him strong and smart and able and David knew from experience that a rock in the right place would bring down a bear or a lion. So, wouldn't it bring, so why wouldn't it bring down this guy, however big he was? And that's what he did. We know this story. He took one smooth stone from his pouch, swung it around his head, and whacked Goliath right in the temple. And the big guy fell down dead, and he does cut off his head. Yes, so the verses go on after what I read. David knew that Goliath was vulnerable to this injury as David himself would be and as that lion or the bear had been from whom he said God had rescued him. David was used to being vulnerable in his life, vulnerable to injury, even though his brothers might tease him for being just a shepherd. It was a dirty job with less status than a warrior, but it had taught him how to be vulnerable for the sake of his duty to the sheep out of loyalty to his father and his family who owned and relied on those sheep for resources. His vulnerability and his recognition of God's continuing presence with him saved the day, or at least won the battle of the day. And historically speaking, it set him up also as a wise warrior, which would be significant in his life and in the story of Israel to this day.